I'm thinking about some some ideas for saving money. I've kind of gone through, and and I'll show you to start, but uh, hopefully some ideas that might work work for some of you, and probably some of them won't work for some of you, but uh, maybe something here will be good. So I'll give you some ideas. Um, I think when I first started thinking about this, and I think I suggest this to many people, is what is your goal you should think about first, and why are you raising the chickens? Um, and I'll assume chickens. You could add ducks, turkeys, uh, whatever. But... Um, you know, think about why you're trying to raise them. And typically, I think most people fall into these categories and, and probably a combination. Are you raising them for meat? Are you raising them for eggs? Um, both pets, certainly a, a lot of people raise them more as a pet, but uh, with some benefits. Um, and that may affect, you know, where you're going with your, your enterprise. Um, <clears throat> the next thing I think I would suggest is what do you what do you hope for? Is it a hobby? Is it to provide meat and eggs for your own personal use? Are you looking for profit? Um, and I, I guess I will say, for this talk, I'm going to assume that you're looking for some profit or at least trying to minimize losses, and and or you wouldn't be here listening to this. Um, I guess I should say I'm also going to assume that you have some experience, so I'm not going to get into a lot of the nitty-gritty of, of raising the chickens, but we'll just talk about some specifics. So um, hopefully that will work. Um, the next thing I think is it's really important that you think about what all your costs are. And in many cases, especially if you're selling a product, you're probably going to need to charge for that. And I can't take credit for this. One of our county agents here in Wisconsin has come up with, I think, a pretty nice little Excel spreadsheet called the Poultry Break-Even Calculator. And I would encourage you to look at that if, if you uh, are looking at budgeting for your poultry. Um, and really, it's just this. It lists all the potential things that you're probably going to be spending money on. And you can estimate those and come up with how much it's going to cost for the bird, and then you can estimate how much you would have to charge per pound or per dozen eggs or things like that. So um, it, it's kind of a nice little spreadsheet, and I would encourage you to look at that. Um, <clears throat> really from there then, basically I said, you know, you want to include all costs, and this is kind of how I've approached this talk, is to go through this list of different costs that you're going to have with your poultry enterprise. And I'll try to come up with some ideas for each one um, on ways you can save some money or at least limit your costs. Um, I did put capital at the end and maybe that's kind of backwards, but I've got quite a bit on that if we get time for it. If we don't, we can go pretty quickly over it. So um, I, I think there that kind of lays out the the organization for the talk, and that is to go through these different costs. Um, so, first thing, you're going to have to get chicks somewhere, okay? Um, and I would say in many cases, there's not a lot that you can do to limit your costs on chicks, okay? You're going to have to buy chicks. Um, you know, there are discounts for larger numbers, so if you can get a bigger flock, you can probably get cheaper prices. Um, maybe you can share that with other people so that you can get that larger number if it's more than you want to raise, um, things like that. Um, I, I would say that in most cases, the chicks are probably not a big part of your total cost, and so... I would say, suggest maybe spending a little more to get the, the right chicks that you get. I think in the long run that might save you money um, by looking at the production capabilities of those chicks. And we're going to talk a fair amount about that. Probably you'll get sick of hearing about that. But uh, I, I think that's something that I would suggest. If you can get chickens that grow better, lay more eggs, use less feed, things like that. I think it's worth paying a little extra 
for the chicks um, in that case. The other thing that often comes up is, well, maybe I should hatch my own chicks. And I think that's a possibility. Again, kind of going back to that first couple slides about what you want to do and what you want to gain. If you're raising dual purpose birds, yeah, that can be pretty effective. Um, if you're really looking for meat production or egg production, you know, you might want to focus on, on raising the birds and not trying to have the breeders. Meat birds, especially those broiler breeders, it's going to be very difficult um, to raise good parent stock for them. So, especially in that case, I would suggest not trying to hatch your own. Um, layers, dual purpose, you might be able to save some money there. It is going to cost where you'll have incubation equipment now, so that would be an added cost. And for those of you who haven't incubated eggs, there's a little bit of expertise involved. It may take some, some practice to really get that right. So again, maybe some of these are, are spend some money now to save in the future. And that kind of brings up the breed selection. And again, I, I've talked about this, but I'll talk about for, for both meat birds and for layers. Um, and in my opinion, and again, some of you may have different ideas on this, but I think in my opinion, it's going to be difficult to beat the Cornish Rock Cross uh, for meat production. And especially from a, an economic standpoint. And I'll go through some of that as we, we get further into this. Um, they grow very quickly. They're going to have excellent feed conversion. The breeders have spent decades really uh, working on efficient growth so that they use less feed for their gain. And so I think they're definitely going to be economical. Um, now, that being said, there are other slower growing breeds. Um, I've got one example I'll talk about here a little bit, and then um, Atra on their website has um, more information on others. But typically those slower growing breeds are going to have poor feed efficiency, feed conversion, and um, will take more time to market, so now you've added costs there. Now, <clears throat> I'll mention this a couple times because again, some people don't like the Cornish rock. It may be that it's worth it to, to have that poor feed efficiency longer time if you can market that cost. So um, that'll be something for you to consider. One example uh, that many people have is this sort of a red broiler. There's some different ones. Freedom Ranger is a pretty common one, some of the different ones. Again, these are slower growing. Um, these are some carcasses. I got some pictures here um, off the internet, but these are some carcasses. There's some var variation there. Uh, this one on the left, you know, is not a bad looking carcass. The one on the right, it may be a little tougher to sell a, a chicken like that. So. Again, I think in some cases these birds can be good, but it may take some marketing to get to that. We'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and again, there are certainly other options. There are some different breeds, some dual purpose breeds that are pretty good meat producers you could go with. Layers, again, I guess I'm gonna suggest the commercial strains are gonna be the most efficient. Um, a lot of these different production red or brown hens, um, a lot of different company strains there, but they are going to have been selected for good egg production um, and feed efficiency. So I think that will be a, a way to save money. Um, another option if you have it, and this is not necessarily the case everywhere, but some situations you can buy ready to lay pullets, that may save you a lot. Um, those birds are typically vaccinated and well-fed and ready to start laying, so you don't need brooding equipment, you don't need um, a, a lot of expertise there. So if you have access to that, that might be a good way to save money. Um, and probably, <laughs> I hesitate to say this, but your extension uh, 
specialist may be able to to source or, or know of some sources for those. Um, not always, but it's possible. <clears throat> so again, those are kind of my, my thoughts on kind of what birds to raise. Um, certainly there are other options, but I think they will be less efficient and less economical typically. Um, brooding costs, again, this can depend on your system. Um, you know, if you're going to raise birds outdoors, which we can talk about a little bit later, um, you're still going to need brooding indoors for the first few weeks. Um, you know, you can use a lot of different systems. A tank like this is very good. It can clean easily. Um, you, you can do a lot of different things. Certainly season can have an effect. If you're brooding them in the middle of winter, it's going to be expensive. You're going to raise, use a lot of uh, fuel and just to heat. So, um, you know, that can be a savings to correct the season or, or only grow chicks when it's fairly warm. Um, but again, I, I think you, your market can depend some on this too. <clears throat> Bedding, I won't spend a lot of time. I think wood shavings are typically used for most people. They're effective, they're absorbent. Um, if you have access to straw, it will work. It's probably not quite as absorbent, um, but it can work. Certainly as the chickens get older, you can put them outdoors on pasture and, and then you will cut down on bedding costs. Um, there are other things I've heard of people, certainly um, in some areas of the country using rice hulls. If you have corn cobs, you know, accessible, those will work. Some people talk about using leaves and, and grass and things. I'm not sure those are, are quite as wonderful, but if, if you have them, um, you know, I, I know some people can make do with them. So um, might be something that you can save a little money there. Keeping the chickens alive, uh, that tends to be a big savings if you can get them to market. Um, you hate to raise birds and then not have any market with them. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about predation. I think we've had some e-extension talks on predator prevention already. Um, and so, you know, again, I, I think building like it's Fort Knox is what I usually tell people. The, you have to build to keep stuff out more than to keep the chickens in. Um, and so um, certainly those are some things that, that you want to do. Um, some other ways of limiting mortality, weather can be a real problem, especially if you have the birds outdoors. This bird on the left has frostbite, so that's not good. That's going to be a, a tough thing on the bird, certainly won't help your production. Um, <clears throat> he's not going to produce much anyway, I guess, as a rooster, but uh, you still want to prevent that. And so there are some things with housing and, and heat that you want to do that. Um, the weather can be harsh, the sun, you want to, you know, build so that you can prevent uh, sun problems. Um, <clears throat> I found this picture, <laughs> I thought this was kind of an interesting one. This is probably not a very good situation. Uh, you know, having them out in the, the wet, swampy areas like this, you're probably going to have some disease issues, or I would expect it. Um, and so again, you want to do things and try to plan for having dry ground for the birds as much as possible or, or be able to move them to a drier area if possible. Um, along with that, limiting mortality, good biosecurity. Certainly, again, I, I can't say it enough that if you have disease problems, that's going to cut into your, your profitability pretty quickly. Um, and so good biosecurity will help. And I think, again, we've had extension talks on biosecurity. Don't allow wild birds in with your birds if you can help it. Don't allow rodents. Don't track in diseases, you know, yourself. Use clean equipment. Use foot coverings, things like that. Um, as far as, as medications, vaccinations, 
I typically suggest paying for the Merrick's disease vaccination if you uh, get the chicks from a hatchery. <clears throat> it, it will save you, I think, money in the long run. Again, if, if you're raising meat birds, you get them up to six weeks old and all of a sudden they die, that's a lot of expense put in. So I would suggest uh, the Merrick's disease vaccination. Um, coccidiosis vaccination or medicated feed, as you can see here, those I think are options um, and you may have to kind of decide on that and, and you can kind of get a feel for if you're gonna have trouble with them. If you're gonna raise birds in that wet swampy condition like I showed you, I probably would look at some of these uh, preventive methods. Um, if you know you can keep it dry, you'd probably be okay with that. Beyond those, there's probably not a lot of vaccinations that are available for small flocks. Um, typically they're in large quantities and, and pretty hard to get. So, um, but those I think are some relative, relatively inexpensive ones that will help prevent mortalities. Then we come to a, a big section and I, I'll spend a fair amount of time here because I think this tends to be an area where we can either lose a lot of money or save a lot of money. And you know, you see this number, but it's very true, and, and people have talked about this for many, many years. Typically, feed is probably 60 to 70 percent of your total cost of production. And so anywhere we can save a bit on feed, um, we, can, we can be pretty uh, profitable or, or help save some money. And when I think about this, I think, well, how can you save on feed? Well. You can do one of three things or, or a combination of three. You can get them to eat less. Um, you can feed a cheaper food or decrease waste. And so I'll talk a little bit about each of these. I think this is an area and there are some things here that I would say can, can work pretty well for many people. Um, so get them to eat less. Well, one way to do that is to restrict feed. And a lot of people will do this, um, and I think purposefully many will do it to try to slow growth, especially on the meat birds. Um, I, I have not seen a lot of research on this, but I doubt that it probably changes total consumption, um, or if anything, probably increases it slightly. The more days that you're gonna feed those chickens, the more days they're gonna walk around and expend energy there. Um, but again, some people like this, it, it slows the birds down, maybe limits a little bit on, on mortality. Um, and so you might see that. Um, with layers, you know, I think especially as the chickens get older, you, they're probably putting on a little extra fat, but that becomes very difficult to uh, limit their feed. So I, I wouldn't jump into that real quickly. A big area, again, and I mentioned this with the breed selection, I think the feed efficient strains are really important. If you get birds that have been selected to be very efficient, that will save on feed. The next thing, and I think this is something for many people, especially, well, with meat bird producers to think about, because I think this can be a, a good savings, um, and that is to process at a younger age, and, and um, I'll talk a bit about this because I think it's something for you to think about. Um, <clears throat> I put together this table, and, and this is not earth shattering, but maybe it'll give you a little bit to think about. So if we talk about a feed efficiency of two, pound, of two so two pounds of feed for every pound of bird produced, and we're growing these birds to four and a half pounds. Um, you know, it's not a huge savings. Even if you grow 100 birds, you're saving 450 pounds of feed. Now, I'm sorry, let me back up. Um, if, we, if we go from a feed efficiency of two up to 2.5, now that's a pretty big jump, but just for explanation. So 
Now it's taking two and a half pounds of feed per pound of bird. It's about two and a quarter pounds extra feed per bird or 225 pounds per hundred birds. Um, if you grow them up to these bigger levels, say eight pounds, again, making that 0.5 uh, difference in feed efficiency, it's 400 pounds. Up here, we can get up to 600. And you can see where these numbers start to increase. Now, the other aspect of this, and this is where I think processing at a younger age can be helpful, is this is a, a conversion chart from a Ross broiler, which is a typical example of a um, commercial broiler. And you look at how with age, feed efficiency or feed conversion gets poorer and poorer and poorer. So this is pounds of feed, again, on the side or grams um, per gram of body weight. So these young birds down here, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks old, five weeks old, they're getting very good feed efficiency. Um, 1.6, 1.7, somewhere in that range. As you get out here to nine, 10 weeks of age, you see we're jumping up there almost to two and a half. So if you go back to this table, you can see where we start with these differences. Um, <clears throat> and if you're growing those birds up to 12 pounds, um, you're probably getting up here somewhere, so you're really losing on that feed efficiency. Now, do I suggest processing them clear down here? No, not necessarily. But here at, say, six weeks, you're probably going to save a lot on feed compared to 10 or 11 or 12 weeks, where I know some people take them out too. Okay. Now, having said that, usually I hear from people, yeah, but people don't want that little three and a half pound fryer, right? Or four pound fryer. They want a big roaster bird. Um, and, and so you have to think about that and meet your customer's demand. Um, you know, in many cases that may be what you're selling is that you have this huge big bird and that's what people like and it's very noticeably different from the bird they get at the store. Um, so, so you have to weigh that, but certainly they're using a lot more food to gain at that, those bigger sizes. Um, the other thing, there can be some flavor and texture changes. So as the bird puts on more fat, you tend to get more flavor. The meat gets a little bit chewier or tougher, if you will, as they get bigger. So again, you have to kind of think about what you're trying to sell. But that's certainly one way that you can save feed by processing at a, a smaller size. As far as lowering the cost of the ration, I think there's some interesting things here, and this varies a lot by each person's different situation. Um, certainly if you're big enough that you can buy feed in bulk, if you're raising enough chickens that you can use that feed uh, quickly and buy in bulk, that can save you a lot rather than buying in 50 pound bags. Um, you know, if you're not big enough and you're storing in a long time, that may not be best. Typically, I would say feed should be used in probably a month at the, the most. So if you can't use it up in that time, I wouldn't suggest buying huge amounts. Um, if you have your own grain source, you can probably mix your own depending on, again, your situation. Um, there's been a fair amount of research with offering grains free choice where if you've got, say, corn or wheat or something like that, um, you maybe can offer that and then a protein supplement and let the birds choose which they like. And that tends to work pretty well. But again, that depends on what you might have available. Um, I, I'll say that I've seen a lot of different people say, well, you can feed 
you know, local things. I live next door to a bakery, and so I get all the free bread that I want. Well, that's wonderful if you happen to live next door to a bakery, but there's not very many of us that do. So, um, but certainly there are some situations like that. You may be able to get, you know, leftover vegetables from your grocery store or from farmer's markets or things like that. There are some some alternatives like that, and they can certainly uh, be a savings. The last thing, and, and I'll probably make some enemies here, but I, I think there's a lot of talk and a lot of thought about having the chickens forage. Um, and certainly it's not a bad thing, and, and I don't discourage it at all, but I would caution you not to expect that to be a great feed saving in most cases. Um, you know, if you have a lot of insects, if you have a lot of weed seeds or grains and things around, then that can be good. But as far as, as eating plant material, leaves and, and grass and things, I, this was pointed out to me by <laughs> someone not too long ago that chickens are not cows. Um, and, and that's not news, but, you know, they are not ruminants. They can't really use the the lignin and the fiber in the plants as a, a great source. So they can get some vitamins, they can get some nutrients there, but probably not a lot of energy, probably not a huge amount of protein. So I think that's one that I don't think will be a huge savings for you. It, it's not a bad thing, certainly by any stretch, but it's probably not going to save you a lot of money. This is one that I would suggest you look at a lot, and that is to decrease waste. Um, good feeder management can save a lot of money and typically it's a kind of an old rule of thumb but birds the feeder should be at the back level of the birds usually and what that will do is help uh, eliminate the birds scratching the feed out or billing a lot of it out um, and wasting it and so if they have to reach up a little bit to get to that feed that usually cuts down on waste. Um, don't overfill the feeders. I've seen this a lot where, well, if, if I fill them really full, then maybe I don't have to come back as often to fill them, but you'll end up losing a lot of feed that way because they'll spill a lot more. Um, many feeders will come with a grate over the, the feed or you can kind of put some chicken wire um, or some sort of a grate over it so that the birds have to pick down through that and again can't just scoop out huge amounts and dump it. Chickens tend to do that if you, you let them, they'll scoop a lot out. Protect the feed from elements so it doesn't get rained on or blown out, things like that. Okay. Um, eliminate rodents and wild birds. Again, I, I think they will eat some feed. Probably a bigger issue is they'll spread disease, but I think um, they'll also eat some feed and waste it. And then this last one, and this one, again, some people don't like to do this, but I think if you're really wanting to save money, eliminate the non-productive chickens. So if you have birds that are smaller than the rest, if something doesn't seem right about them, um, you know, they're injured, they're probably continuing to eat and, and not growing as well, probably not going to produce very well for you. Um, and, and so I would suggest in most cases that you humanely cull them. Um, the non-layers, this can be a little more difficult, but if you can tell which birds are not laying, you know, again, it, that can save you money by, by getting them out of the flock. And along with that, I, I threw this slide in. This is something that uh, I think kind of goes with it. Typically, after about the second year of production, layers probably are not going to produce enough eggs to pay for their feed bill. Um, and, and so, if, again, if, if you're trying to be profitable, um, I would say keeping chickens past that two years is probably not helping. Um, you may have different uh, 
situations and might go longer than that, but typically that's the case. And I think this is a way that a lot of people do this. They like to have the larger eggs from those second year hens. And so if you get in a habit of replacing half of them each year, then you always have some new ones coming in and you have some that are a year old and producing a little larger eggs. So that can be a nice rotation and then you know you've got uh, good producing birds. Processing for meat birds. This is a place where there can be a lot of expense. Um, if you have a commercial processor available, it's nice. Uh, you can define what the cost is. They'll typically give you a price per bird and that's what it's going to be. I would encourage you to also include transportation costs in that. Um, when you're deciding how much to market the birds for. Um, because that's certainly going to be a cost. I know here in Wisconsin, we're very limited. There's a handful of processors across the state, and so some people end up driving quite a distance uh, to, to have their birds processed. Um, if you're doing home processing, again, a lot of costs, um, <clears throat> you know, equipment, you're going to have to have some sort of heat for hot water for scalding. You're going to need probably ice or refrigerators, bags for packaging. So you want to include those costs. Um, while I'm mentioning that, it's not necessarily saving money, but I think it's something to think about. Make sure you check the legal requirements um, for your state. Here in Wisconsin, we can have we can sell birds directly from the farm um, without inspection, but if we're going to sell them off-site or to restaurants, we have to have inspection. So then you have to get to a processing plant that would be there. Um, so again, that's not really saving money, but I guess it'll save you money if you're gonna get fined for it. So um, you do wanna make sure you're, you're legal. <clears throat> Don't forget to add marketing costs. Um, <clears throat> You know, are you going to do some advertising? Are you going to be dealing with the phone and, and calling people back and setting up deliveries or pickup times and things like that and your time? I think those are all costs that you want to include into your, your situation. Um, <laughs> Again, time and labor, is it something that's free? I think growing up on the farm, this was, we always considered labor to be free, but uh, it, it's probably not, it shouldn't be. Um, so there are things you can do to save time and that will in turn then really save you and allow you to do other things. Um, <clears throat> so marketing that, Again, this kind of, maybe it's not saving, but it's a way to come up with the cost. Um, I, I think, you know, you need to make sure that you're charging enough to cover all of those costs um, and, and certainly can do that. In many cases, we are kind of selling this story of, of the, uh, the way you're growing them and, and the farm. So maybe that goes into that cost, but you want to charge uh, proper amount. Um, <clears throat> some other things you might think about. <clears throat> Can you make money by cutting up the broilers and selling parts? Um, this is something I think to think about. In many cases, this probably can increase demand. Certainly not everyone knows how to cut up a whole chicken or knows what to do with the whole chicken. So maybe you can make some money there by value adding. Um, you know, it's added labor. And so you have to think about that. The other issue that often comes up with that is what am I going to do with the less desirable parts? Okay, everybody wants breast meat or maybe drumsticks or thighs. Um, now what do I do with the giblets and the necks and, and backs and things like that? Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's a way that you can make money, but, but you have to think about those side things. Um, with the eggs, there are certainly some specialty eggs you could market. You can do omega-3 eggs. 
You can feed different uh, products for that. Certainly you could go organic. Um, there's going to be steps with that, but that will certainly increase your, your uh, income. These green eggs or really dark brown eggs, these are becoming pretty popular. Um, you have to get the proper genetics for those, but that can certainly be a, a value-added specialty you could uh, produce. Um, <clears throat> some other things, again, I mentioned I'd encourage you to get rid of cull hens that aren't laying um, and to rotate your flock. Maybe you can sell those hens then as stewing hens when they're at the end of their productive life. Um, that can be a nice little side income. Maybe you can sell manure. <laughs> that depends on your situation and where you are, but in some cases you may be able to do that. Um, so I think those are some other, not so much cost savings, but ways to uh, add to the bottom line. The last thing that I'll, I'll kind of talk about, <clears throat> and again, I've got some different thoughts here on different housing options. Certainly, again, I see this a lot with ways to save money are, well, I got all these wood products from somewhere down the street. Well, again, that can vary by your situation, but there's definitely no reason you need, you know, brand new equipment and lumber and, and roofing and things for a chicken house. As long as you can build it solid and keep predators out, that's um, that can be a really good method to save money. Um, <clears throat> so if you have access to those things, that's wonderful. Um, I'll talk just a little bit about some pros and cons with the different types of, of housing options, and then I think we'll have time for some questions. So these mobile sort of chicken tractors, um, as many of you probably know, sort of been made famous. Um, you can move these around. And there, there are lots of different versions and options. I think almost everyone who's made one has a different uh, option and different method for making them. Um, and you can have a whole bunch of them like you see here. Um, <clears throat> so some, some things there, they do tend to be inexpensive, especially some of those you, you saw made with you know, PVC piping or, or things like that. Um, you need a bit of land so that you can have pasture rotation with them, but they can work well. You can probably raise sheep or cattle or something else in that pasture. Certainly they cut down on labor from a, a cleaning aspect and you don't spread manure, but they do tend to be pretty labor intensive. So again, that depends on how you're charging your labor. If you consider that to be free, then this is a pretty uh, low cost method. If you don't, then it's maybe not so. Um, weather is not very suited to these quite often. They can be very hot in the summer. They can be cold in the winter. Um, but, you know, given the situation, they, they'll usually work pretty well in the summer. Um, labor is also a bit of an issue getting feet and water out to them. Um, <clears throat> And so that's going to add to your time spent there. You do still need a brooder. Typically, you're not going to put baby chicks out there. So that's going to add to your cost. You'll have two systems, but you're probably going to use that anyway. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think there are pros and cons to those. On the, the front end, they're probably pretty inexpensive. Depending on your management skills, they may not be as, as inexpensive in the long run as you think. Um, so then we have more of a sort of a mid point where we have more of a solid building, but it's mobile and so you can move this around. And these work well, especially for laying hens. You can have nests in them um, and they work a little bit better over the winter. Um, <clears throat> still a bit less labor than the others. You, you don't have to be out there every day and move them. Um, but you can still move them around a bit. They're probably more expensive from a capital standpoint to build. Um, you still are going to have some issue with water. 
getting it to them. So again, depends on whether the, the capital is worth more than the time spent uh, might be a consideration. <laughs> Um, and then we have more permanent ones, and so you can have a solid building here. Um, this is one I saw, and I probably wouldn't suggest this at least up here, but it would be an option. Um, this would be more what you'd think about with a permanent run. And you see a nice solid building, solidly built uh, area. Um, some things to consider there from a cost-wise, they do tend to cost more from a capital standpoint. You're building a solid building. Um, you can have water and electric and everything attached, so that'll save you a lot on day-to-day -day labor. Probably safer keeping predators out. Um, it can add costs where you may end up with more parasite issues and mud issues. As you can see, you probably can't keep forage in that area when you have chickens there constantly. And so you may have more disease issues in that situation. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, again, there's some trade-offs there and you'd want to think about which one saves you more in the long run. So, Maybe that gives you some ideas, some thoughts um, on, on some money-saving ideas. So, we're doing okay on time? Yeah, we are. Uh, I was going to say we've got, a, uh, uh, we've got a question from Michelle, but she's sort of volunteered to go, go live. But, uh, Ron, if you'll stop sharing your, your screen, we're going to promote or attempt to promote Michelle to panelists and allow her to join the conversation here. Let's see. Michelle, are, are you there? Not seeing her here. Let's give her a second maybe to rejoin in case she dropped off. Um, there were a couple of comments in chat. Uh, in chat, uh, T, T, T Bob says, what about uh, fermenting your feed to, to decrease food consumption? Yeah. I think that probably will help a bit. Some of the, the fermenting can make nutrients a little more digestible. Um, so it, it probably helps a bit. I'm not sure it's going to be a huge amount, but it probably helps a bit. Okay. Um, a comment Jeff made was, he says, uh, one, one thing that's worked well for us is buying hatchery stock after one year for very low cost for $4 a bird and then keeping them for, for one year. Yeah, that's great. If you have access to that, that would be nice. I'm sure you get a good year production out of them, and that's a pretty good deal. Um, well, Michelle's question was: she originally, uh, I don't, I don't, I didn't see her jump back in and in, in the on the viewers list, but she asked about. Uh, she said, uh, "Well, let's see." There she is. Hey, hey, Michelle, can can you hear us? Okay. Okay, you're not. Uh, we're not. Your audio is not quite coming through. Can you, can, you, can you try and speak one, one more time? Let's see if we can hear you. And it looks like she might have froze up on us. Michelle, I think your uh, internet might be a little slow, but we're, we're going to ask your question online, and uh, you, can, um, if, if you can either listen as a viewer or you can come back and watch the recording later. But, uh, Ron, her question was uh, she, she had an outbreak of poultry pox, in, in her flocks, uh, I've, I've been unable to find a, a vaccine for the new chicks. D does she need one? So, pox, um, I don't think huh. it's good. I found it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Well, Michelle, I, I just asked Ron your um, quick, the, the question. Is there anything else you wanted to add as far as your, your question? I don't know. I just I just got back on. You kicked me off, and I had to get back on. Sorry, and yeah. And I had no uh, audio, so I had to figure out how to do that. Okay. Well, I, I just read your question that you put in uh, the question and mm -hmm. answers. Is there anything you wanted to add to, to the question? Well, I would like to know about the, the vaccinations. I had, was not even aware that poultry pox was a problem until I was hit with it. And I had a flock of 30, I lost six out of it. 
yeah. so do all of my future chicks need to be vaccinated because I read on the internet that the current ones that had the poultry pox are now immune to it so I wouldn't need to vaccinate them right that's correct and I don't think you'd necessarily need to vaccinate the next ones. Um, I should, it's not like those that have had it are going to continue to carry it and spread it to your new ones. It's, it's often spread by mosquitoes. So chances are there's other birds around somewhere and the mosquitoes transmitted it from some others to yours. So, um, you know, it's not like you're, you're, facility is infected and you're going to get it again necessarily. So I would say you don't have to vaccinate. If you would like to, I mean, they got it once, there's a chance they could get it again, but I don't think it's, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, well, on you know, internet it said, because I'm only going by the internet, uh, my local uh, veterinarian, the only one that would do chickens, sure. um, wanted $150 per chicken. And, you know, I'm not paying $150. I've got 30 chickens. So, um, anyways, uh, the Internet says that the scabs, I mean, I'm cleaning the best I can, but scabs can be hidden. And that the area itself could continue to be contagious for up to nine months. I mean, is that true or... I guess I, I don't know off the top of my head if it's that long, but it, it could be. Um, so, I mean, if you're getting new ones fairly quickly, you know, it, it certainly would be best to vaccinate. Yeah. I already have 30 new ones. My hands okay. apparently love chicks because they hatch them, jump off the net. They, they raise them for about three weeks and then they run right back and sit again. <laughs> so it's like, I, I'm seriously considering getting rid of my rooster because I'm being <laughs> overrun by chicks. Yeah. And I don't know if I can even eat them or sell them or do anything <clears throat> with them because I've had this poultry pox issue. That shouldn't be any issue with the the health, the, the safety of the birds. That's um, the the pox virus, foul pox is nothing related to human pox. So um, yeah, that shouldn't be an issue as far as eating them or selling them. As long as they, you know, I wouldn't sell them when they have the active scabs. Right. Just from a, but um, yeah, it shouldn't be a, a human issue at all. Um, okay. You and know, to other flocks, as long as they don't have scabs themselves, I could sell them to someone else wanting to raise chickens. Yeah, it should be fine. Um, you know, if you have other birds that actively have it, I don't know that I'd sell them at that point because they may be infected. You only have one right now. I have one chick Okay. that has it right now. And I've kind of got him over to the side away from the others, but... Yeah. Um, I, I guess I would suggest maybe not selling them at that point because it, that is kind of a slow-developing one that they could... You know, you might be selling them off to somebody and then they might get sick right away afterward. The chickens might. Yeah. Um, how, long, how long is the incubation, do you know? I... Again, off the top of my head, I don't. I know that it's it's fairly slow because I've heard of people actually vaccinating. Like when the one shows symptoms, they'll vaccinate the others, and and you can get ahead of it. So, um, I, but I don't know exact numbers off the top of my head. Okay, so where would I go to get the vaccination? That. I mean, I haven't even been able to find anywhere other than a vet who wants yeah. to pay 50 bucks a chicken, you know, so it's like... I believe some of the online veterinary service uh, places will sell that. I don't think you need a prescription for that. Um, there are some, again, veterinary service uh, 
Is it a veterinarian thing? You have to go to a vet to get it? I, I, I don't believe so. I think you can order it without. I, I'm i kind of pulling off the top of my head, or I don't know exactly. But, um, but I think you can get it without. It's sort of a strange vaccination because it's given in the wing web, so you get a little two-pronged. Like one shot per bird? It's not even a shot. You get a little two-pronged little fork-looking thing, and you poke it through the loose skin of the wing. It's kind of a strange one. But I, I so you think have to do it per bird. Yes. And it's not like something you put in the water or their feet no. or... No, okay. it would have to be each bird. Each bird. All right, we, we've got a couple other questions here. Michelle, thanks for your, uh, your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Well, for I appreciate y'all's help. Sure, sure. Th thanks for go going live, too. Um, um, Ron, there's a question in Q&A. Ma Weber says, uh, Ron, you were talking earlier about limiting commercial feed and offering whole grains, uh, free choice to save costs, or limiting grains as well. That is what I, I do in my backyard flock, and it seems to me that I save on the more expensive commercial feed. Is this being done with broilers? If so, do, do the numbers show it's true? So... <laughs> What has been done with broilers is not so much what they will do is have a protein source available. So a sort of a, a high protein um, feed and then offer the grains separately and the birds choose which ones they want. And again, if you have the grain, then that's cheaper. And that tends to work pretty well. The birds will eat, you know, what they need. Um, if you're just offering the grains, that tends to be lower protein than they probably need. So take corn, for example, is only about 8 to 10% protein. The chickens will live on it, but it's probably not going to be best, and it'll slow down their growth. And, and my guess is they'll end up eating more in the long run. But um, you know, and if it's a layer, you may not get as many eggs as you would expect, but, uh, uh people do it. I just don't know if it's ideal. Uh, Jeff in Q and A uh, says, how, how about using spent grains as a, a supplement? Like from a brewery or, or things like that, I assume. Yeah. I don't know, Jeff, if you, if you want to clarify or add something in, in chat, um, she said, yes. Yeah, I, I've heard of people doing it. I think it'll work. Um, you know, I think you have to be able to feed it to where it doesn't get moldy because I think it's often going to be wet. Um, but if it's, you can certainly do that and it will work. Yeah. Yeah, just as a side note, I'm in uh, Jeff I, I, or um, um, Ron, I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. And so it's not kind of a big foodie area here. And a lot of independent restaurants in town and you mentioned marketing the products and specialty per products and those things so there's a lot of that that's going on in western north carolina and we're seeing more and more of that sort of boutique type farms that and not only that but a lot of farms are forming relationships with uh, individual restaurants in town so whether it's beef or chicken that those kind of things that and from a marketing standpoint the restaurant uses that as a sort of a marketing pitch for its food and its place that they have a relationship with a particular farm and that sure. that's where they, they get their meat or, or eggs from. So, Yeah. Yeah. That can be really effective. And again, you can not so much saving the money, but charging what it's, what it's cost. Yeah. Okay. Any other quick questions, folks, we'll take another 30 seconds or so. If anybody else has any questions, go ahead and ask. Ask them now. Um, so we are recording this. Um, I assume most of you probably got here via the Learn event, but I put that in chat. That's that. That's the uh, that's the Learn event for this webinar. A recording will be available there. Probably will take me a day or two to process that and get it up uploaded. So feel free to share the event and the video with uh, friends or colleagues who you think might be interested. And I don't see any more questions. So, Ron, thank you. And uh, thanks for taking questions and for the presentation. We've got 
we got uh, uh, Ma Weber. She, she, she's got a follow up there. She says, let, let me revise my question. Are people raising broilers offering the grains along with commercial or high per protein feeds uh, with the grains and the rate of gain is still good? I know ch chickens will balance their own diets, but do they still gain well? Yeah, so there was work, um, a lot of it's been done in Europe more so than here, but it's been very good. You lose a slight amount in breast meat yield. I think for most people, you it wouldn't be very noticeable. If you're a large company and you're raising a million birds, you might see it, um, you know, or, or multi-millions, but they did grow equally well from the research I've seen. Um, and, and again, it's, it's a pretty small difference in breast meat yield, but the actual, the overall bird yield has been equivalent. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Jackie put, put in chat too, just so folks know the next, uh, webinar is going to be September 15th, raising ducks for egg production. And, uh, you should be able to find that on learn, uh, learn.extension.org. And, uh, at this time we'll go ahead and close. Thanks, Ron. Thanks. Yeah.